Welcome to the Sustainability in Motion podcast, brought to you by ED4S. We focus on the fast-moving sustainability world to help the business community better understand the sustainability and environmental challenges we face. I'm Matt Orsog, Chief Content Officer at ED4S. I'm Maria Maizaradze, CEO at ED4S. And I'm Noah Al-Sadi, CEO and founder of Canada Advisors and Chief uh, Advisor at, uh, at the ED4S. Well, today we're going to do something pretty interesting. Uh, we saw uh, Narwar alerted us to a report that came out recently beyond checking the box by the IBM Institute uh, of Business Value. And the report does a great job of describing how companies can embed sustainability into what they do. It's a topic we hear all the time from investors and companies, and they want to know how do they do sustainability? How do we do sustainability? Well, this report offers some help. And uh, now we came across this report, so I'm going to let him uh, introduce it, and then we'll get into the discussion. Oh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, this is really one of the most interesting reports I've read of late. And as, as you guys know, I, I read a lot of these reports. This report was published uh, uh, in late February by uh, the IBM Institute for Business Value. They surveyed 5,000 C-suite executives in 22 countries across 22 industries. And what they were trying to find out is uh, they want to understand the sustainability performance of these companies and their sustainability and integ integration approaches. Uh, the key finding of the report is that companies that fully embed sustainability into their business, and, and here I really mean fully, this is not just some kind of add-on, fully embedded across all business line operations and workflows, do uh, experience higher business value. And they do provide evidence to that. They do say that organizations that embed sustainability throughout their operations are 52% more likely to outperform their peers on profitability and have 16% higher rate of revenue growth. Outside the financial implications, the report does touch on organizational structures, operational workflows, data management, and sustainability training and upskilling, among uh, many other topics. But before uh, jumping into all of this, I'll stop here and uh, hand it back to you, Matt. All right. Thanks, Noah. And we, we encourage people to read the report. You know, after listening to us, of course, because uh, it's, it's there's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, but to help us unpack it, we're going to each go through a couple of things that we found interesting and then discuss those. Uh, Maria, why don't you kick it off? Thanks, Matt. And thanks to the, for the summary uh, now. So I guess I'll just start off with what really resonates with me and ED4S. And it's really core to what we do is one of the statistics that they bring up in this report is that 76% of executives said that the sustainability is central to their business strategy, okay? But yet 31% of those organizations report that they actually incorporated it into their operations, data management, and improvements that they have. And so this is a huge gap between the strategy and implementation. And I think it's completely understandable because we're still in the early days and this way is not paved at all in a lot of organizations. This is something that ED4S has been working for the last four years. How can we close this gap? How can we help the management, the leadership teams and the CSOs now actually incorporate sustainability into the front lines, the day to day across the organization? So one of the challenges the CSO teams had for a long time, chief sustainability officers teams, is that they kind of started it, most of them from a reporting or communications perspective. And so they actually had to run after different departments to collect the data. All these departments are not really aware of importance of this information, how it's being used, what is sustainability. There's still so much confusion and politicization of this topic. And so this becomes a really difficult, difficult task for the sustainability leaders because now they're just running and begging, begging for this information across the organization. What if we could flip this over and actually empower and create this awareness among the front lines and across different departments, what they can actually do. And that's something that we noticed that's pretty much lacking in the industry in terms of the education and skill building. People are not aware of them, in, whether it's marketing teams, sales teams, HR, to IT, or whichever other teams within the mainstream corporate world. What can they actually do to help the organization to achieve those goals? 
And I think the sustainability training is a big part of it, but also there is an important piece where those leaders have to actually set aside resources and also be very clear about the goals and objectives that should translate throughout the whole organization. So it's not should it should not be just an objective of a sustainability team, but rather run through each department and map it out how each department actually helps the broader goal of the company, the broader strategy. So that's my take. And I'm I'm very excited on the gap because there's clearly a need for what we do at ED4S. And would love to hear your thoughts of what do you see in the market in this regard. Yeah, I was really surprised. Let well, me not really surprised, but a bit surprised that this number 60% was so high. Because I remember back in about you know, 2005, 2006, when ESG was coined by the PRI and the subsequent years since then, this was a refrain that you you heard. Uh, in the early days of the ESG and sustainability, that you had to have a trade-off between returns uh, and implementing ESG, integrating ESG into what what you did. It wasn't it wasn't part of people didn't really think of it as part of strategy or as you know fundamental analysis. It was this thing over over there that you had to add, and it was going to mean that you had you know worse returns or you had to sacrifice something. So I, I was a little surprised that that was that sixty percent number was still uh, was still so high, still above fifty percent. But I guess I, I've, I kind of came back to something I've in these kind of discussions I've always cautioned and, t- and told people that think about the accounting system that we have and we use today, double entry accounting. Uh, and I forget um, the actual year it was started, but it was years ago, it was you know centuries ago uh, in Italy that the double entry bookkeeping accounting system we use today was started. And I don't think we've right quite perfected that. You know, so give ourselves be a little bit patient with people integrating sustainability and ESG in the investment process. But I thought we'd be a little farther along than 60%. But hopefully if IBM does this again in five years, that number will be a little bit lower and and you'll have more more folks who've gone through the financial system and training system where they just integrate, they understand that integrating sustainability and ESG is just part of the process. Um, Matt, let me just ask you a question. Are you referring to the 76% gap that uh, Maria just mentioned, or is the 60% a different number? The 60% uh, of executives who said they have to make a trade-off oh, yes. between financial and sustainability outcomes. And that gets back to the, you know, when, when sustainability issue first came out, it was mistaken as ESG is negative screening. And people thought, oh, I have to sacrifice something for sustainability. I have to sacrifice returns. And it's the same kind of discussion that you have to make a choice between financial and sustainable outcomes. All right. All right. That's clearer. I I, I did notice both of these insights. And I think they're both very interesting in the trade-off and around the gap. Just staying with that gap a little bit, because actually, Maria did steal my thunder. I was, this was going to be my most uh, interesting inside of this out of this report, which is that seventy six percent saying that this is sustainability is so essential to their strategy, but only thirty one percent of them are actually incorporating sustainability data into operational improvement. And there's a massive disconnect here because you can't manage the sustainable pillar of your strategy without data. And if you actually read through that report, one thing that stood out to me, beside the need for upscaling that I think Maria highlighted very well, actually only four out of 10 organizations have proper data structure to receive data in in, uh, sustainability data from their core systems, the enterprise kind of risk management system, the asset management system, CRM, energy management, and facilities management. And and this is a recurring theme across industries is that companies want the sustainability data, but they don't have the informational infrastructure to do it. And again, staying with that report and that theme of data, the report does distinguish between companies that really embed sustainability, they call them the embedders, and the ones that don't. And the embedders, for example, have about almost 200% more alignment in tr- between data and sustainability, uh, uh, between their data strategy, sorry, and their sustainability strategy. And they are more likely, about 130% more likely to source data from across the enterprise. So I think there's this skill aspect of it. And then there is this infrastructure aspect of it. And certainly, ED4S, we can help with, um, uh, with the skill side uh, of things. 
Yeah, that, that gets right into the, the thing that stood out to me the most. I'm a corporate governance guy at, at heart in the, in the ESG world. I started in the governance world. And so I'm always looking at the story of the company and the culture, you know, the interaction between, you know, those three points of the triangle, the board, management, and employees at a company. And what really stood out to me, uh, really popped for me, was that this is about culture. You know, this is about having a sustainability culture at companies. Uh, if sustainability is in your culture, you tend to succeed. You tend to do things well. And if it's not, it's a struggle. You know, people see, and, and there's a great graphic in the report that shows, you know, companies that embed sustainability in what they do and some that see it as kind of like a project off to the side and some see it as a compliance exercise. And the compliance exercise and the project off to the side doesn't really embed things uh, in your culture and you don't get the benefits. And, you know, the numbers that stood out for me was that you mentioned, you know, the companies that are 52% more likely to outperform their peers on profitability with a 16% higher rate of revenue growth if they're embedders, if they embed sustainability in what they do. And that's just a fantastic argument for embedding sustainability into the, your investment process of your investor or your or your strategy and what you do if you're a company. But that takes a cultural change, takes, you know, it's moving a super tanker if you're a big company, especially. It takes time and it takes dedication and that's got to come from the top, but also buy in from uh, everybody at the company and, and the board. And so it's not a snap your fingers kind of, we're going to start doing this on Tuesday kind of thing. Uh, which is why it's hard and why why I, I'm not surprised that there's that disconnect. Can I jump in and ask you guys one philosophical question that I've been reflecting on over the last, I would say, months now? Sure. Talking about the culture, right? And the world where it's everything is driven by profits, growth, constant expectation to bring more shareholder value. So in the context of the system that we live in today, which is largely still shareholder capitalism, is it really possible to have that sustainability transformation? The report talks about operation, operations, improving efficiencies, um, converting the data into insights, which is great. But I think if we take a step back and look at the whole business model of these organizations. A lot of them could do all this efficiently. However, the business model itself is still not aligned with where the world has to go. So what do you think about this need or even our ability in the corporate world to reconcile the need to still thrive in this, uh, you know, the expected growth in terms of economy performance versus the need to reconcile with the long-term sustainability of what next generation will need in the world. You just turned a 30 minute podcast into a three hour podcast. <laughs> I know. Because while you're saying that, I'm thinking of all these things to say and, and they're philosophical ones, economic ones, you know, human ones. Um, it, it's interesting. I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of them, but it's, it's interesting. You know, we've lived in the, as you said, in the, era of shareholder primacy. And I think that's changing. You know, I think people are taking more of a stakeholder view, um, especially, you know, we've seen ESG and sustainability grow in the past years. And this report is the evidence that a lot of people need reports like this to, oh, my, I'm going to do better as a company, or I'm going to profit more as a company if I embed sustainability into what I do. And another thing I see is looking at the younger generations, I'm not going to name everyone's age in this podcast, but I'm, I'm a middle-aged guy, you know, in America. And I've seen surveys over the past years, because it's something I've been studying, of, you know, the generations behind us, um, their faith in our capitalist system uh, in America and the West. And it's not good. And it's declining. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch in the coming years. You have the shareholder primacy on one hand colliding with the younger generations who see things getting worse environmental uh, on the E and the S and the G uh, and the American dream, if you will, I have air quotes, you can't see it's because it's a podcast is something that they don't quite believe in as much anymore because they see it kind of slipping away economics wise, you know, they can't buy houses, they see what's going on with the environmental issues. And so there's a big questioning of that system. Uh, and that system will change. I don't know what's going to change into, but I, I think we're moving away from sharing our primacy because we see of the ne we see the negative externalities that we've ignored for a long time. It's just what is the speed at which that changes, and what does it change into? And I'll stop there. 
Yeah, that ties into your comment about trade-offs, right? Because all of this is trade-off. The interests of our shareholders in four months or when we announce our quarterly results versus what do the next generation need to see as a change in order to meet their needs. So this is an excellent question, Marianne. And I know it takes us a little bit further away from the report, but I, I think I can take us back into the report by basically stating that... So th- this discussion around the shareholder side and, and the stakeholder side has been ongoing for a while. And, and I think Matt was referencing somebody like Milton Friedman, who talked in 1970, that the, the only responsibility of business is to shareholders and to generating profits. Uh, but he did say something actually in that article of his, he said companies should pursue a social objective only if it increases profit. Well, guess what? What this report says, what this IBM report says is that sustainability actually increases profit. And and the embedders in this report, the majority of them would only proceed with a sustainability initiative or implementation if it actually meets a certain goal in terms of a business return or, um, or a certain alignment with their strategy. And that really speaks volume as to the incredible capability to align the sustainability strategy with the business strategy to ultimately generate better profit and better return. So that distinction, which I believe has existed in literature for a while, in practice is actually not there. These th- these two things are highly aligned. The trade-offs that I think Matt alluded to as well earlier in his comments are really a question of time arbitrage. It's about short-term versus long-term. And, and I think every responsible and serious investor and capital holder knows that if you manage for the short-term, ultimately you're going to destroy capital. And, and, and we see that uh, asset owners and pension funds and so on wanting uh, a longer-term approach to business management because they know over the long-term that creates value. And that's what sustainability is enabling. So I think we're finally entering an era where uh, the distinction is will become uh, less pronounced, and people will understand that sustainability is good business. I've lost. I've lost track. Is it my turn to go, or is it? Uh, is it yours? Oh, no, it's now where I think you have. your next. Oh, me again. It's all right. So, all right. So, with that, let me just go to my next insight in terms of what I think is interesting. I, I think something that really struck me as well in this report is that. Companies that actually are successful in embedding sustainability spend less on a specific sustainability projects than companies that pursue sustainability as an add-on. And if you unpack that and dive further into a report, you see the, the reason for this is because sustainability is not a distinct activity within these companies. It's fully embedded into the DNA of the way they conduct business, whether it is through choosing their suppliers, the way they um, uh, put together their uh, investment and production processes, the way they hire people. It's not that all right, I'm going to go through the list of business objectives, and then I'm going to have an overlay of sustainability objectives. The the two initiatives are so integrated that they are indistinguishable. That's why you don't see these companies putting specific sustainability investments the way non-embedders think about them. Now I'm going to do some big sustainability project. They're just doing business as usual. That happens to embed the principles of sustainability. So that that insight, uh, I found pretty interesting. I don't know what you guys think about it. Yeah, though that goes back to in my in all my years, I'm dating myself, but my you know two decades or more of looking at these things. If you saw the biggest, shiniest sustainability reports from companies were usually the ones that had the least to say because they were making a big deal about, look at this big sustainability thing we're doing. And the embedders, even back then, you know, companies were doing it very well. It was just part of how they did, how did how they did things. And they didn't call it out as this separate thing that they did. Now, that's a, that might be a little hard, but harder as an investor to uncover. But if you know, if you follow a sector well, and you know the companies in it, you're going to know who's doing things in a sustainable manner, you know, across the board and everything they do, and who's making a big shiny object that they want people to look at that isn't really worth much. Yeah, makes sense. And I'll maybe bounce on that in terms of sharing my own experience from talking with the dozens of financial institutions that are now trying to upskill their teams. So from what I'm seeing is that, you know, the state of the market is still very 
early stage in the sense that the majority of employees are really not initiated to sustainability topics. They still don't know what ESG is. And this is talking from a North American, Canada, US perspective. And so when it comes to upskilling people, it's very hard to actually get their buy-in and have them dedicate time to learn about something that is confusing, that's complicated, and it's not directly tied in into their day-to-day work. And so often enough, when we work with business leaders, sustainability leaders to bring the education to their teams, and a lot of it is actually mandatory education, we always insist that they start with their a message from the top. One of their leaders will actually open up the training saying, you're doing this training because it's important to our strategy. It's important to our goals. We need you to be part of this movement. And so setting the level of importance, I think it's one of those key ways of how culture could start changing and actually creating this interest around sustainability. And then it's coming down to actually grabbing the attention of individuals within different teams, right? If I'm in a marketing team, why do I care about climate change? Why do I care about different regulations that come around branding? Why do I care about greenwashing? I think today with all the legal actions and expectations from different stakeholders, it is easier and easier to make an argument and around all this cases. In case of ED4S, like we started specifically because the frontline financial advisors were not able to speak about ESG investing strategies. And this was 2019, where the ESG and sustainable investing was already gaining quite a bit of ground. And so it is it's, it is a risk to a business reputation, but it's also a missed opportunity to not have your frontline uh, upskilled and have the cultural shift to make it very clear across the organization that there's actually really value to be created by actually gaining those skills uh, in your day-to-day work. But yeah, it has to be still mapped out and still a lot of work to do. I'd like to jump on that, Maria, because I love this focus on training and capacity building. And that really goes to the core of what this report is about. And I want to give a concrete example. Let's take diversity and inclusion. For example, a lot of people think of this, that this is the S side of ESG and sustainability. You build a team and then you're going, you're going to scan the team to see whether there is gender balance, whether there is racial balance. You're going to go through these metrics as if they are some kind of a ticking box exercise. But if you look at this from a pure business point of view, there is tremendous amount of research that shows that diverse teams are more innovative, they're more productive, and they ultimately lead to a higher uh, uh, work satisfaction and higher profitability and return on invested capital. So if you embed that knowledge into a a manager's perspective, they are going to put diverse teams together because not because it's the right thing to do, because that's what creates a more resilient, innovative, productive enterprise. And these concepts repeat themselves across sustainability concepts, whether they are environmentally driven concepts or they are governance driven concepts. If you embed them into the function as a way to think about business and to get a competitive edge, then you become a better business professional who incidentally as well is somebody who is very conversant in sustainability. And I feel that's really the added value of entities like ED4S and others. We're not coming here to tell people, leave your business aside and now think about these issues. The, the, The magic out of this is making them both work. That's why I brought this report to uh, to our team's attention, and and I'm uh, and and I believe that's why we're having this podcast as well to really highlight how important that fusion is. That really highlights the the whole you know, anti ESG movement that we've seen over the past couple of years. Things like diversity and inclusion, things like you know in, environmental uh, data. You know, people who are resistant to that, you, they can have very good reasons. But you look at the data. You look at what what's the data behind it, and I was going to say the same thing about you know I've been you know looking at corporate governance issues for you know twenty plus years, and those reports on diversity were were around back then as well. Is that you know diverse groups you don't want you know you don't want a board that's all the same that has all the same experiences that think kind of the same, uh, no matter if those board that board's all men, all women, all a minority, all white, or or, or whatever. You want that diversity because you want different ideas clashing. Uh, in a collegial way, uh, and people bringing different talents to the table. And that's just going to, you know, if you think about it, and you look at all the literature, it's going to get you to a better place if you're a company. And the same with, you know, environmental data, 
you know, I want this data as an investor because I want to see, is this a risk? Is this an opportunity? It's not a woke thing. It's, I need this data to make an informed decision. All right, we're, we're, we're bumping up against uh, 30 minutes, which is where we kind of want to keep things. So I'll, I'll go with my, my, my point and then we'll, I guess we'll finish up the Melwars. Uh, another thing that I liked about this report is it's, it's a bit of a how-to guide for, for folks who are looking at how do I do this, whether you're a company or an investor. And one of the things I liked, it's on page five of the report. You can pause the you can pause the podcast now and go find the report and look at page five. But it, but there's a lot of things like this in the report. It breaks, breaks down. It doesn't tell you exactly how to do things. But I like when, when a report like this tells me what's the process, you know, because I can figure out the process. But give me some guide on the process. And they lay out a process for, for embedding this into what companies do. And it, it just breaks down to embedding it in strategy embedding it into people's workflows, embedding it throughout the organization uh, and in decision making. And if you think about it, those four things, and you can add, you know, depending on your organization, things you can, you, you know, things you might want to add to that. But if it's a project off to the side or if it's just compliance, you're not doing those things. You're not integrating it in strategy. You're not integrating it into, into people's work. You're not integrating it into the organization or decision making. It's just, oh, we've got to tick this, tick this box, which is exactly what, you know, where the title comes from. And what I've heard, you know, for ages about people who just, well, we've got to tick this governance box or this S box or this E box. Uh, and so I would, you know, I would tell people to jump into the report and it's a great resource of just of the how, you know, cause that's a question I've been hearing for you know decades about how do we do this? How do we do governance better? How do we do E better? How do we do S better? This is one tool that I think can help a lot of companies do that. Yeah, that's a good summary of the process, Matt. And another one visual that also jumped up to me in this, in this report was the figure two. It actually shows... Uh, I would say the sustainability journey of a typical organization. So at the very, very basic level, that's a compliance focus. So that's where you have one person show, sustainability leader that's in charge of reporting and compliance, just making sure the company doesn't get in trouble and just respects their very basic obligations. And I'm really curious to hear, like, uh, among our uh, listeners today, how many of you work for organizations there at that first initial level? And obviously, there's a, still a very long way to go and a change in a mindset. And I, I do empathize with them because I do have some clients that work with, and there's a, certainly a, a long way to do in terms of getting that executive buy-in and, and making it really clear of the importance of this work, which eventually unlocks the resources, unlocks the time for other teams to focus on this work. So we have the compliance and we have the sustainability as a project and that involves maybe selected group of other team members, maybe IT will get involved to get your data integrated. And then we have the third and complete one, the way now we're describing it, it's really embedded sustainability. Each department is in charge of implementing sustainability within their function. They have a clear understanding on what are the impacts, which stakeholders they're exposed to and are able to, whether it's collect data, put in metrics, set goals. So they're really taking accountability for that sustainability work that eventually connects to that business strategy. So that's another great tool uh, as a visual way to see how the company actually integrates uh, at different levels the sustainability work. Actually, Maria, as you spoke about this, that that was page seven on which I was looking, um, which is figure two. And I think yeah, I think it's a perfect visual. Uh, I think it really builds up on Matt's point um, on how companies uh, should practically uh, actually implement the sustainability. I think we could end up potentially on this forward looking point, jumping to page 17 of the report that talks about areas where executives see um, sustainability being integrated uh, going forward over the next three years. And there is integration, a growing integration across the across the organization, across all business function. There is an expectation that there will be a jump in integration all the way from 31% increase in integration of the supply chain level to 132% increase in sustainability integration at the finance uh, function. And I feel that also that Visual is is interesting in understanding potentially if you're looking at your career path, if you're looking at uh, if you're a solution provider, uh, if you're looking to understand where business is going to be in terms of 
uh, the level of maturity of ESG integration at different departments. I think that's an interesting visual, and that's also giving us an indication how executives are looking and prioritizing. I was struck that finance is the one where executives see the largest increase, um, 132% increase in uh, in integration, while supply chain was the slowest, there's a lot of focus on supply chain. But to be fair, if you look at that visual, you see that the level of integration at the supply chain level is already higher than finance today. So at the end of the day, in five years, we're looking at about 45 to 50% level of sustainability integration across different functions. So there is a lot of momentum in this industry. The executives are not just saying that 76% of them that sustainability is central to their strategy. They're also saying this is going to grow materially in importance and integration over the next three years. So uh, obviously, um, that's encouraging to see. And I'm sure Maria Edifera is going to play a part in preparing these executives at these different functions to, um, to integrate. Thanks for the plug, Noah. <laughs> I actually had a maybe a, an idea of why finance has a, such a big jump over the next three years. So about 132% increase. It's probably because of the reporting, right? Most of the sustainability reporting will probably now move to the accounting departments. So that probably you know, regulatory reporting increases that need for finance departments to start really embedding this in their processes. Yeah. And that, and that goes along with things like the CSRD, uh, the SC in, in Europe, uh, state of California and rules. They did it on climate last year. The SEC just came out with theirs a couple weeks ago and they did get sued. We talked about that when it came out, they did get sued by someone. Uh, so it's delayed slightly, but all those things are coming ar around and it's going to make the, that compliance arm of it more more something that finance has to think about. But again, if it's just seen as, oh, we just need comply to comply with this, they're really missing an opportunity, we think, uh, based on what we've seen here. Well, we've kept everybody for, I think, a little over 30 minutes. Thanks for everyone listening. Thanks again, Maria and Nawar. And feel free to reach out to us and let us know topics you think we should be discussing. We've got the next couple of uh, ideas already teed up, but uh, we're going to be hopefully doing this for a while. So get in touch with us. We're all on LinkedIn. Uh, you know where to find us and take care.